In this video, I'm going to teach you how to design Butterworths of any order. After watching this video, you'll be able to design, for example, low-pass Butterworth filters, high-pass Butterworth filters, Butterworth bandpass filters, and Butterworth notch filters of any order, that is, any number of poles. In a Butterworth filter, the poles are distributed evenly in the negative left half of the S-plane. The radius of this circle around which the poles are distributed is given by omega naught, where omega naught is the corner frequency of the filter. Therefore, for example, if we have an odd number of poles, in this case five, one of the poles is going to be real and the other four are going to be complex. If we had had an even number of poles, then all of the poles would have been complex. If we have an nth order filter, that is, it has n poles, each of the poles will have a position given by S sub k. In the pole zero plot up here, this would represent a five pole low pass filter where the number of poles n equals five. K would then be an index that runs between one and five. S sub 1 would represent the position of pole k equals 1. S sub 2 would represent the position of pole k equals 2 until we get to S sub 5. Butterworth filters have an important property, and that is that they have the flattest possible passband near the corner frequency of the filter. If it were not a Butterworth filter, say if it were a Chebyshev filter or an elliptic filter, there might be ripples up here in the passband. I'm showing the transfer functions of two different types of filters. The filter up at the top is a high pass filter and the filter at the bottom is a low pass filter. There are really two important parameters that you need to define when designing a Butterworth filter. Of course, the most important parameter is the corner frequency. The second most important parameter is the roll off. A one pole filter, for example, would have a 20 decibel per decade roll off, whereas a two pole filter would have a 40 decibel per decade roll off when you're far away from the corner frequency. Let's now describe how you would go about designing a Butterworth filter. The design procedure that I'm going to describe here works for any order and any number of poles. Number one is that you have to choose what type of filter you want. Do you want a low pass filter, a high pass filter, a notch filter, or a band pass filter? No matter what type of filter you desire, we're going to start off with a low pass filter. The procedure is going to be that we'll design a low pass filter first, and then we'll convert the low pass design into a high pass filter, a notch or bandpass filter as you may so desire. The second step in our design procedure is to define the necessary order of the filter. Since we're first designing a low pass filter, this is equivalent to just stating how many poles the filter is going to have. Number three is that you need to decide whether you want a shunt or a series fed configuration. The circuit on the left represents a series fed filter because the first element is in series with the source. The circuit at the right represents a shunt fed filter because the first element after the source is in shunt, that is it's connected to the ground. No matter which configuration you choose, the filter will do the same job. It will have the same roll off in terms of decibels per decade. Since both of these circuits represent three pole filters, they'll each have a 60 decibel per decade roll off. I recommend choosing a series fed filter when you have a low source impedance and I recommend using a shunt fed filter when you have a high load impedance or simply to minimize the number of inductors in your filter. The next step is optional. If you wanted for some reason to know what the transfer function of the filter would be, you can refer to this chart. We know from before where the position of all of the poles are for our low pass filter here. Since we know where the positions of all the poles are, we then know what the transfer function of the filter is going to be. What we have in this table effectively is the denominator of the transfer function H of S according to the order of the filter. You might not necessarily need to know what the transfer function is when you're designing a filter though. The only thing that really matters is the filter's frequency response and roll off. The next step in our filter design procedure is to create a prototype circuit. Now a prototype circuit is a special circuit that assumes that you have a one ohm source impedance and a one ohm load impedance and a corner frequency of one radian per second. So what we're going to do is design a prototype circuit that works when all these values are one and then we're going to scale it to the actual source and load impedances and operating frequency in your particular circuit. Let's say for example that we wanted a five pole filter. 
I would refer to row five on this graph, and I can see that I have five different elements here. If we want a series-fed filter, like the one down here with the inductor first, then I'll refer to the lower set of labels down here. This value would then correspond to L1. This value would correspond to C2. The L1 value is measured in Henry's, and the C2 value is measured in Farad's. Inductor L3 would have a value of 2 Henry's, capacitor C4 would have a value of 1.618 farads, and inductor L5 would have a value of 0.618 Henry's. That's the prototype circuit. Now what if we wanted a shunt filter instead, like the one shown down here? Since we're designing a shunt-fed filter, the capacitor is going to come first. That means we need to use the labels up at the top of our table. The first circuit element in our filter is going to have a value of 1 farad, inductor L2 is going to have a value of 2 Henry's, and capacitor C3 is going to have a value of 1 farad. It's important to remember at this point that the two circuits that we've just designed are only prototype circuits. That is to say, they have a corner frequency of 1 radian per second, they're both low-pass filters, and they have source and load impedances that are both 1 ohm. Now we need to scale our prototype circuit to match the values in, say, an actual circuit. Before we do this scaling, now's the time to transform the low-pass filter into other filter types. For example, if we want to convert our low-pass filter into a high-pass filter, everywhere you see an inductor in your prototype circuit, you need to replace it with a capacitor. And everywhere you see a capacitor in your prototype circuit, you need to replace it with an inductor. Then you need to scale the values by taking the reciprocal. I'm not explaining to you why this works, I'm just telling you that it does. We now have the appropriate prototype circuit, either low pass or high pass. The next step is to take the circuit values on our prototype circuit and scale those to the values in our actual circuit. We now need to know what the load impedance and operating frequency are of our filter, that is, the corner frequency. The same formula is used for every capacitor or inductor in our circuit. So for example, if I wanted to scale this inductor in our low-pass filter, then I would plug that in for the prototype inductance down here. If I had a 50 ohm load, I would plug that in for RL, and if I wanted the corner frequency of my filter to be 1 kilohertz instead of 1 radian per second, then I would plug in 1 kilohertz down here for corner frequency. I'm going to use the same formula for L3. Just keep in mind that the prototype value for L3 might be different than the prototype value for L1. I got the prototype values from the chart. Let's look at an example. Let's say that we wanted to design a third order Butterworth low pass filter with corner frequency of 10 kilohertz. Let's say that the source and load impedances are matched at 50 ohms. We're going to construct both series and shunt fed circuits, and then we're going to convert the designs to high pass filters too. Here's what the low pass prototype circuits look like. Since we'll be designing a third order filter, I need to refer to row number three here on the chart. And I notice that our three circuit elements are one, two, and one. The numbers are the same regardless of whether the filter is series fed or shunt fed. One, two, and one. So you can see that with the series fed filter, I have values of one, two, and one, and the units are Henry's, Farad's, and Henry's. But with the shunt fed circuit, we also have values of one, two, and one. It's just the labels are Farad's, Henry's, and Farad's instead. Now that we have our prototype circuit values, we need to use those formulas in order to convert the prototype values into the actual values. We have to make use now of the fact that our corner frequency is 10 kilohertz and our source and load impedance are both 50 ohms. The low pass filter design is now complete. You'll notice that since both of the inductors started off with a prototype value of 1 Henry, they also wound up with the same value in the final circuit, 0.8 millihenries. The same thing is true with these two capacitors. They started off with prototype values of 1 farad, and they wound up with identical final values as well. What if we wanted a high pass filter instead? Well, the first thing we need to do is to look at our low-pass prototype circuits and replace every capacitor with an inductor and replace every inductor with a capacitor. We furthermore need to rescale our prototype values by taking the reciprocal. The reciprocal of 1 Henry is 1 farad, but the reciprocal of 2 farads is 0.5 Henry's. 
reciprocal of one farad gives me one henry, and the reciprocal of two henrys gives me 0.5 farads. The next step is to just use the same scaling formulas in order to convert our prototype circuits into the actual filter. Using the fact the corner frequency is 10 kilohertz and the source and load impedance are both 50 ohms, we have the final high pass filter design. What if you wanted a bandpass filter instead? If you'd like to make a bandpass filter, again, you need to start off with a low pass prototype filter. To convert your low pass filter into a bandpass filter, you simply need to add a partner for every circuit element that you have in your prototype. Every inductor gets a capacitor and every capacitor gets an inductor. That means that a three-pole low-pass filter is going to become a six-pole bandpass filter because you're going to double the number of reactive elements in the filter. The prototype value of the partner element is going to be the same as that of the original. For example, if I see one Henry, then it remains one Henry afterwards in the bandpass prototype, and its partner capacitor also has a prototype value of one. You can see here for our capacitor that we started off with a value of 2 farads. That value remained in the bandpass prototype, and the partner inductor also had a value of 2 henrys. This now brings us to the scaling laws. For a bandpass filter, it's necessary to have three pieces of information in order to complete the filter design. It's necessary to know the center frequency of the passband, the width of the passband, and again, the source and load impedances, which are assumed to be matched. We have two different formulas to use for our scaling, depending upon whether you're in the shunt branch or the series branch. If we look over at our prototype circuit, this is an example of a series branch. So I would use these formula in order to scale it. If I make a mini plot of transfer function versus frequency for a bandpass filter, I'm going to have a high pass side and a low pass side. In these formulas, B refers to the passband, F0 refers to the center frequency of the filter, and R sub L is the other unknown referring to the load impedance. In our prototype circuit, these are the two shunt elements. I know that these are shunt elements because they're connected to ground. Since these are shunt elements, I would use these formulas to scale the prototype values to the final values. B and F0 have the same definition that they did for the series branch. A notch filter has a very similar design procedure as a bandpass filter. The only difference is that the partner element is arranged in a slightly different configuration. You might notice that for the bandpass filter, every time we had a series element, I still had a series element when I changed prototype circuits. Every time I had a shunt element, the partner element was also in shunt. For a notch filter, it's a little bit different. Every time I add a series element, I'm going to add it in parallel. Every time I add a shunt element, I'm going to add it in series rather than adding it in parallel like I did with the bandpass filter. Again, every partner element will have the same prototype value that it did before the conversion. So this one Henry inductor remains a one Henry inductor, and then the partner capacitor has a value also one. This two farad capacitor remains a two farad capacitor, but the partner inductor has a value of two Henrys. Here are the scaling formula for the notch filter. The capacitors and inductors for the shunt branches are scaled with these equations. The shunt branch refers to this branch because it's connected to the ground. These are the series branches which have their own set of formula. You might have noticed that with all of these different types of Butterworth filters, I always assumed that the load impedance matched the source impedance. That is to say, I always assume that RL equals RS. Of course, that's not going to always be the case in an actual circuit. In the next video, I'll look at ways that we can handle realistic situations where the load impedance is not matched to the source impedance.